Hello there and welcome to this week's edition of Em's Kitchen. So tonight I'm going back to where I was born and we're going to do um, an Em's Kitchen twist on, on Namibian street food which is also called Kapana. Now, if you didn't know this already, Namibia is the country where meat is the number one thing we eat. So if you, and, and we love our game, we love our steaks, we love beef, we love lamb, we, we just, we a, a nation of meat eaters. So I'm going to make some kapana, which basically is beef, and then I'm going to make it with some fed cook. So really quickly before I make the fed cook, I've just, I've put on the fire. So the fire is outside, uh, just to recap really, Typically, people would, you know, kill a, um, um, a cow or something like that, and then they would hang it. Now they'd need to hang a, some find a place for the meat to hang. Um, and sometimes, very often, in rural communities, especially, the meat would be hung from a tree or something similar. So out in the open, and then the meat kind of gets a little bit air dry, and it and it basically helps uh, with the texture of the meat when you eat it. So. You can imagine, obviously, if you're hanging something from a tree outside, it attracts all sorts of what we would call in the UK wildlife, insects, and all that kind of stuff. And so, what happens then is strips of meat are cut, some bits of fat, uh, liver, etc., all that sort of stuff, and it's and it's fried on a grill um, on the side of the road, and it's cut into pieces, and then it's sold like that. So, I'm doing my Ems Kitchen twist now. Obviously. I'm not gonna be taking a cow and hanging it from a tree because, well, I'm just not gonna do that. So I went to the butcher and I asked the butcher what is the, you know, what would be a suitable cut of meat? And he basically gave me the um, bit of meat that's used for dicing steak. Now obviously there, there can be so many parts of the, of the cow you know of beef you know if you can imagine but we're in the UK and the UK is not known for fatty meat in fact uh, in, if anything we're known for much leaner cuts of meat so what I've done is I've taken the capana spices and the capana spices is basically a combination of sort of celery coriander salt MSG a bit of um, cereal um, and then it's mixed with some pepper and then it is um, combined. Now it depends on where you go and lots of different places lots do lots of different stuff. But basically I've got a piece of whole, um, well would have been used for dicing steak um, and then I've got a bit of rump as well. So because it's got no fat on, the fat is obviously the thing that keeps the meat moist and that's why when you cook stuff it's always important to remember not really to you don't you don't have to eat the fat but you kind of need to keep it on because it actually keeps the meat moist so I've basically put this in some just sunflower oil with the capana spices that I've rubbed into the meat just for half an hour so I'm going to just leave that there for a second and I'm going to make so the movie has got lots of lots of different classic dishes and typically capana would be served with a sort of salad, like a salsa made from um, finely chopped tomatoes, onions, chili, vinegar. So if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I made some um, tomato chutney. It's got all the same ingredients as this um, salad, with the exception of obviously, I've got some sultanas in here and some sugar, but it's exactly the same thing. So rather than crying my eyes out like I normally do when I peel onions, I am going to just use this instead. So that's been sealed, that's been sort of um, maturing now for about two weeks. I made that about two weeks ago. So I've got my deep fat fryer and what I've done is I've taken the bread recipe that's in Naked Baking and I've just um, let the dough rise and I have made these into rolls that I'm going to make into fed cook now. So this is my mother's um, recipe. My mother would typically use, my mother loves using 
wholemeal flour. So these have been resting for a little while. The oil is about 175 degrees. And so I'm just going to rest it on here. So I wouldn't necessarily, when I make fake cook, rest it for this long because sometimes, depending on how you do it, it can affect its ability to, to, to rise. But we'll see. We should be okay. Fingers crossed. Everything will be fine. So basically my fake cook recipe, as I said, is in my is in naked book baking. And fake cook is one of the things that you would have with Kapana. Because you need some kind of bread to dip up the, um, the sauces that you get from the meat. So in Namibia people would say it's your it's a balanced meal. <laughs> so you can imagine a bit of starch and a bit of protein and a bit of salad and you're away. So I'm going to be just making while the fire is getting ready because of course I'm using charcoal. Um, I have got some kindling wood in there but I haven't got camel thorn, and camel door and hout or, or sirkelbos or, or something like that that we would use in Namibia to make um, fires from. So I'm improvising and of course it takes a little bit longer so I thought why not do the fake cook in the meantime. So I've got two, four, two, four, six, eight, nine, nine uh, fake cook rolls in there and that will take me about I'd say about 20 minutes and that should be enough time for the fire to be really really hot. I'm hoping. So the thing is, if people, when people make fake cook, it tends to, um, they tend to put it in, um, well obviously they fry it in oil, but some people fry it in a pan, some people fry it in deep fat fry like this. So deep fat fry of course is great, but it does mean that it obviously it retains, it controls the temperature a little bit because of the difficulty of course with oil is oil's temperature keeps rising so it can become quite dangerous and oil can very comfortably, sunflower oil etc can rise well above 230 degrees so it becomes seriously hot and quite dangerous so you do need to be careful which is why if you're doing this kind of thing and you do happen to have a deep fat fryer I'd recommend using that rather than um, you know and the first, first thing with anything like this, of course, is always the test. And because it's whole wheat, it's micro, it's, um, as I said, it's my mother's, my mother likes to make feku with whole wheat bread. <laughs> so she's the only person I know who does. Um, but so what I did is I used my recipe and I incorporated some whole wheat, which means that it's a little bit, the texture, whereas white bread flour tends to be really puffy, with whole wheat it's not quite so puffy, it tends to be a little bit more compact, which is absolutely fine. So okay, so the first fake cooks are out and I'll show you now what they look like. I just want to put the second ones in because what you want is when you serve the pana, now it comes off the grill and when it comes off the grill of course it's got to go into something. So, you know, ideally this is something that you wouldn't do alone, you would be doing this with someone else. You'd be with a family member or somebody who's going to help you make this kind of dish. And Kapana is also kind of, if you see people, you know, all sorts of ages of people cooking and preparing this kind of food. Now, fake cook is very much an Namibian classic. It's one of the top five things um, a lot of the sort of trip um, sites recommend to try in Namibia. I just wanted to talk through some of the other things, which is uh, quite interesting. So, um, obviously in Namibia, it is the only place in the world where the desert meets the sea directly. It is an incredibly breathtakingly beautiful country, but it has got very sparse rainfall. Average is about 250 mils a year. So we have a very different concept and appreciation for water than the rest of the world, and certainly in the UK, because we have so, um, top five things to try in Namibia game, obviously, because Namibia is probably one of the first countries in the world that's got nature conservation inscribed in the constitution, and about 40% of the country is a nature reserve, um, and so wildlife is protected. So we have all the big five, and we've got lots and lots of antelope, Kempsbok, Kudu, uh, Springbok, Mpala, Lesbok, Waterbuck, and everything in between. Take a 
you know, you name it. And so we're very, very lucky that we have a lot of games. So game obviously features really highly on that list. I just have to keep an eye on the pickle. And then um, Capana, which is beef and um, beef prepared street side, so it's street food. And then um, one of the other things is fekuk and mince. So I'm doing fekuk with Capana. Um, and then Mupani worms, which actually they are worms. <laughs> and it's a delicacy that is very synonymous with Namibia. And they are big, fat and ugly things, but people love them. And I've never had Mupani worms in my life and I hope I never have to. But it is a delicacy absolutely in Namibia. I was trying to think what the first thing was. It actually slipped my mind. But they are, you know, obviously Namibia was a German colony. Um, and it was settled by the Germans in well before uh, Britain came to Southern Africa. Uh, Namibia was a German colony. So we have a heritage, a much a, very much a culture of Germanic influence, both in our architecture and our food and all that sort of stuff. So the kind of stuff that we that we love to eat is, is um, Brechen, which is basically uh, bread rolls, which is like an oval shape as opposed to a round shape, and the top is really hardened. And the Brechen that you get in Namibia is really different to the Brechen that you get in the rest of the world. It is really, I don't know, I'm not really, you know, they were trying to work out why that would be, and they couldn't quite figure out why the Brechen in Namibia tastes quite different to anywhere else in the world. But, so we love Brechen. I grew up on Brechens. If you go anywhere as a treat, you go visit my family. When I go visit my family, that's what I get served for lunch. I get Brechen with cold meats and things like that. So, um, and very, very German. So we, uh, you know, we do eat a lot of sort of pork products in Namibia because that's quite, you know, that's quite German influence. And then also we love things like lamb, Namibian lamb. I always think Welsh lamb, Namibian lamb and Karua lamb, you know, I challenge anybody to prove to me that there's better lamb in the world than those three places, so, you know, I, of course I'm biased, but I'm fortunate that I'm from Namibia, and even better than that, I live in Wales, so that's cross of two of them. I've never lived in the Karua, but, uh, you know, things could change, you never know. So, um, I'm just going to just show you the spices. I just actually want to just get the spice mix out just to show you. So this is a pre-mixed uh, Kapana, Namibian Kapana recipe. So this has got salt in it, um, mustard, cumin, parsley, um, and unfortunately a lot of spices also have MSG in it, which is not my favorite thing if I'm honest. So, but it smells lovely. I love the smell of coriander. And so what I've done is I've added some coriander and some black pepper to this because I always think to myself, if you're going to air dry stuff, it reminds me of biltong, so why not? So the smells coming from this packet is absolutely fabulous. And so what I've done is I've literally just dry rubbed the meat. So I've got a piece of meat here that would have been used for diced beef from the butcher and I've got a rump. And this is a lovely piece of rump. It's about five, six hundred grams. So it's a fabulous steak. So. I just put that in a little bit of sunflower oil in the fridge for half an hour, okay? But if you bake kapana the traditional way, it would have fat on it, okay? So, the fat is obviously the thing that's going to keep it moist, and therefore, you don't need to, you know, marinate it in oil. And actually, what people do is they cook the meat, and then they put the spices on the side and people kind of dip people kind of dip their um they meat in the spices which I find is quite strange. So some fed cook may have been made there. So these fed cook is not as big as my normal ones because I normally use white flour whereas this is whole meat flour. So the whole meat flour makes it a little bit more dense which is fine. So while we're waiting for the fed cook to, to fry so what I basically do is I use my classic bread recipe that's in Naked Baking, my cookbook, and I turn it into fed cook. So I've got two bread recipes in there. The one has got oil in it and the other one is just uh, flour, salt, 
sugar, yeast, and water. So this is the one that I've got here. The only difference is I'm actually using whole wheat flour. So I've just put a little bit of um, kitchen towel at the bottom. It's just to absorb some of the fat that comes out. And the nice thing about obviously putting something in a, in a metal container is it retains the heat a little bit longer. But the best thing obviously about fat cook is that you want to eat it fresh. What, Nina? <laughs> so Nina's very, very happy to be on the program tonight. And so she's drawn you another picture or colored in another picture for you. So we just, <laughs> no Nina, we're not gonna do art class. We'll have to do art class a different day. Okay, it's so normal. I'm uh, Nina. Okay, and the last one that she's uh, colored in for you. So I'm just gonna turn the fake cook. But you can, of course, you can make fake cook on an open fire. But remember, when you do it on an open fire, obviously that's gonna, what's gonna happen is the oil is gonna be really, really hot. Um, and that makes it quite dangerous because the difficulty, I suppose, with oil on, on a stove top or open fire or whatever, is you have to try and keep the temperature constant because if it's too hot, it burns the outside and the inside is raw. And if it's not warm enough, it absorbs a lot of oil, which makes it really fatty. And so it's a bit like, um, you know, obviously it's fried bread, but it's a bit more, it's more like donuts in texture, I think, rather than taste like fried bread, you know, because obviously fried bread is flat and all that kind of stuff. But Fed Cook is absolutely classic, traditional South Africa and Namibian food. Fed Cook is one of the things, the first things I learned to do with my mom. Um, we were not allowed to actually ever buy them, make them, we were allowed to kind of help her knead the dough and she had this absolutely ginormous enamel pot, you know, bowl and we used to, I remember our little hands in there trying to knead the dough because of course it takes a lot of time, especially if you use whole wheat flour and so then it would go in the sun under, under blankets and it would be out in the sun for a couple of hours for it to double in size and then we go back, you collapse it, and then you do a double rise. So I did the same thing today, believe it or not. I actually put <laughs> the big cook outside in the garden under a blanket. So I felt like I'd gone back to my childhood. That was quite funny. Um, but the thing is, it's, that's the whole point about food. It is about our culture. It's nostalgia. You know, it's all the things that reminds us of where we come from. So... Instead of making it with the salsa that you would normally make, because primarily, mostly, because whenever I cut onions, they make me cry incredibly much. And of course, you have to chop this really, really finely. And if it, the more fine, the more I cut onions, the more they make me cry. And I've tried all sorts. I've tried bread in my mouth. I've tried wet hands. Oh, I've done all the whole works, but they, it still makes me cry terribly. So rather than have a crying program, which wouldn't be much fun, or, you know, perhaps for you, but not for me, um, I am doing this with my preserve, which is exactly the same thing, because it's got exactly the same ingredients as you would have. I've got chili in here, I've got um, tomato in here, I've got onions in here, I've just got sultanas in here as well, and vinegar, of course, and some sugar. So. The, um, so that is the difference. So I do these obviously two at a time. My deep fat fryer isn't particularly big and I've got it on 170, 175 degrees ish. Um, so these are a little bit over. They should have gone in a little bit sooner. So they are collapsing a little bit. So I'm just kind of getting them to retain their shape as much as possible. But they're fine, they're still going nicely round it, they not have them collapse completely. That is the danger with anything like this, you do need to get your timings right. So, um, but like I say, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those things, because of course when it's warm, measure 27 degrees inside the house, and it was colder outside, so I, I put the fake cook outside for it to rise and for it to double in size. So can we put that on the table please, rather than on the floor? And so the, um, 
so like I say, I put it outside to double in size, and I put it outside around about four o'clock. So I thought it should be ready about around about six o'clock, but it wasn't. So I put it inside the house, and then I, you know, obviously collapse, and then I could you've got to knead it again, or just collapse it, and then you've got to shape the fed cook. So lots of people do lots of different styles. All that I've done this time around is I've just coated the surface in um, a bit of oil. Actually, I haven't coated the surface in oil. I put a little bit of oil on the on the um, dough when I put it to, to rise in the first place, and I just used that to shape it because it was enough. It was more oil than I would normally put on it, and oil just stops uh, the the dough from drying out primarily. But I, like I said, I wouldn't normally put that much oil on it. It just so happened to be quite a lot on this occasion. So, if you fancy some upani worms, <laughs> that is a complete Namibian delicacy. I've never had the pleasure, and I quite honestly hope that I wouldn't <laughs> have the pleasure, but it is very, very, very much a staple in Namibia. And of course, pup. Um, so depending on where in the country you are, either the pup is made from maize or the pup is made from um, uh, something else, another another grain, which is more in the north of Namibia. Um, so obviously maize is very much a staple food. We do eat a lot of pup, but of course the thing that Namibia is synonymous with is meat. So if you like a Namibian, know a Namibian, you impress them with meat. And I'm not even joking when I say that, it's true. It's absolutely true. It is, you know, the, the most <laughs> common thing to eat in Namibia is meat. And so, so if you're vegetarian, sorry. If you're vegan, really sorry. But there is plenty of other lovely things to eat there, of course, as well, as long as you can cope with people who like to eat meat. So that's the only thing to remember. If you're offended by meat, then perhaps, you know, just consider that in your travel plans. Um, but like I say, it is absolutely beautiful, beautiful country. I'm just uh, turning this back up. And just, I'm just going to keep, just check that the fire is still okay. It is okay. Okay, so look. So the coals are really, really nice and hot now. And so that's perfect. You want it to be hot. If I were to put this on a normal grill on the side of the road what would happen is of course it would smoke an awful lot because it reduces i mean it um, releases fat fat fuels the the flames and it just goes lots of smoke so i put this in oil so it's going to smoke that's fairly likely so what people do a lot of the time now is they put little foil tubs underneath it and then put the coals around it but remember we don't do that in Namibian traditional cooking that's very much a, like a new new way of doing stuff um, so, so I'm gonna do it a little bit old school even though I'm doing it on the weather I haven't got a flat grill even that though that's the way I learned how to make a fire so what I've done is I've cheated my um, charcoal a little bit today and what I've done is I put some balls of paper crumple up paper you could use newspaper but I don't happen to have any newspapers in the house so I've just crumpled up some balls of paper, put a little bit of kindling, put it underneath the charcoal, a uh, couple of um, uh, fire lighters, and I've lit that, and that's made sure that the charcoal goes a lot quicker than it would. It would take about half an hour normally, and it's windy outside, so it would probably take even longer, and the fire would probably die. Um, and I don't like using um, a liquid paraffin and all that sort of stuff to light the fire. I, the smell is awful. Um, I do try and use fire lighters if I possibly can, that's the way I learned how to do it, and kindling. Um, and I would normally use wood, I love cooking with real wood, but I don't have any at the moment, so I'm not going to stress about stuff that's not that important. So we're down to our last two fed cook, pretty much. And so, I just kind of want to show you... They haven't, like I say, they haven't risen as much that they would normally, but this is because it's whole meal flour as opposed to, you know, strong white bread flour that I would normally use. So we've got some nice freshly made fed cook, whole meal fed cook in this instance. 
it's going to be fabulous when all that I'm going to do is so traditionally you put the steak, I mean the meat, um, onto the grill. Now, I, if you're from Namibia, you you do know your meat. It's it's kind of one of those things that's kind of expected. So there's lots of parts of the body of an of of a piece of cattle that can make the suitable meat for kapana. Kapana tends to be you're not going to put your fillet on here, and you're not going to. It's not going to be your rump or your sole on a fillet. Okay, it's going to be all the other bits. So you know. Just remember that and so um, and obviously the cheaper cuts of meat people can give you the better But it remember the thing to remember is depending on the cut of meat the meat can be quite tough So people put the meat on the fire with bits of liver um, Bits of fat etc. The fat keeps it moist the fat is put on top of it generally The spices are kept on the side and then you get given this um, Sort of container with kapana in it, oftentimes put in newspaper, and then you have this kind of a relish, which is what I spoke about, the tomato, chilies, onion, and vinegar to the side of that, and then you also have some spices. So spices are salts and things like this. But this is a pre-mixed kapana spice. It, you know, I did bring this with from Namibia, um, and it is lovely. I love the aromas, but the only things that I've added to that is because I like that is I've added some uh, black peppercorns and some coriander um, because for me that's kind of authentic uh, with beef and so I've got one rump in here and I've got one unknown piece of, <laughs> of beef which I was trying to work out which bit of the body this would be but it's used for dicing steak so it could be lots of bits of, of the body you know it could be from the from the neck it could be from the you know the leg it could be it could be from lots of places it doesn't matter but of course it's got no fat on this all the fat and all has been trimmed off this so what's going to is why i put it in some sunflower oil because it's going to be otherwise it's just going to be really dry and it's going to be tough and we don't want any of those things so when you grill you're grilling at high heat okay none of this fapping stuff oil underneath all that sort of stuff no namibian Brian doesn't do that. We put it on the fire, okay? We want it hot sear and we like our, our meat, uh, typically sort of medium to rare. Well, I like mine medium rare. Lots of people eat their meat rare. I can't really eat it rare. Uh, medium rare is fine for me, but depending on, on how people cook it, it can go all the way up to well done. But remember, the difference between something well done and something medium rare is it can be quite tough. And the nice thing about... Um, Namibian street food is, of course, it's about culture, and it's a, and so you can go to one of the townships. There's, you know, markets and stuff like that. But there's markets everywhere, and the point about Kapana is, people would actually have it on the roadside. So you'd literally go to the street corner, and people would be would be, frying meat, grilling meat, like this for people to eat, and people would queue up, and it could, and people do this day in day out, and it literally, you know, it's lots of people's jobs, and. Uh, it is it's really really authentic so this is my garden it looks a bit like a jungle so it's not an authentic Namibian garden i'm afraid to tell you and i've got a really nice hot fire yeah. okay so i'm going to take david you're supposed to help me can you hold this thing closer to the thing for me okay so i need to put this enormous bit of meat straight and that's exactly what I thought would happen because of the because of the oil okay so I've just taken that to the side um, and that is the danger because of course if you're cooking <laughs> cooking with oil it's gonna cause a flame so I do not want to do a typical barbecue we do over here where your stuff is charcoal and normally I wouldn't actually uh, move the meat because I don't like messing with meat when I cook it. Nina, can you step away from there? That's really hot, okay? Mama. So I've just, um, okay, we worry about your little butterfly Mama. in a minute, Nina, sweetie, please. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to sear this and then you would continue cooking this, continue cooking this and you'd cut little bits off as you cook it and you'd serve it straight away. So you can't mess around with this. So I'm just obviously using my 
metal tongs as opposed to my other ones and I am going to turn this because of course I did um, put this in oil so I'm not going to put the rump on I've got rump in there as well that's a lovely piece of rump but I'm not going to put that in there yet because the rump is going to cook a lot faster this is a big piece of meat and you can do this really slowly if you wanted to you can do the sort of thing that tends to be really trendy now where people put a little foil case underneath and put the coals around the side and you do it like a bit like a roast in the oven but of course this you know I'm not making a roast in the oven I'm doing braai style and so kind of the idea would be to like you would in a steak you know like with a steak you'd sear it and you'd sear all the sides and that seals it in and then it continues to cook but you do need a really do actually want a hot um, grill for this you don't want this to be a cold thing because a you'll be here forever and it's just to give you an idea is that people would actually cook whole pieces of meat like this they don't heat it tenderize it with a mallet and all that sort of nonsense they literally put it on the fire Okay, so I'm just searing all the sides, like I've done now, and then basically that's now going to cook for the next, well, depending on, on how you want it cooked, but that's going to be there for a little while. And I'm just going to continue turning it. I don't like turning my meat too often. I like it to be quite brown, but I don't want this burnt. I do not want that whole black look that does nothing for me, if I'm honest. And then I'm going to put the rump on as well. And then... I think the thing is, obviously, what you can do, is, it's up to you, you can cut it into, into cubes, of course, but you can also cut it into slivers, it doesn't really matter, but kapana would be sort of cubes, so don't worry about that, and the kids are going to have some fed cook because they're hungry, <laughs> that's the, that's the, I suppose it's the best thing about, you know, fed cook, there's one, <laughs> One youngster who's enjoying some fed cook. And you can see it's got a lovely texture. Show them, Nina. Turn it the other way. See, the fed cook's got a lovely texture. It's a lovely, sort of bready, fresh. And it's really, really fresh, which and is the best thing. It's very bumpy. <laughs> it's very bumpy, she says. And that's because obviously it's whole meal. So, like I say, you just, you do, you can't really walk away from this. I wouldn't suggest you. Mama? Try and go sit can somewhere I else. Can I have that one? Yes, sweetie. When it's finished, you can have some, okay? But it's not ready yet. So I'm just going to cook this, carry on cooking this now. And then I'm going to dip it into some of that, um, some of the chutney. Put that down for me. Put that down, sweetie. I'm going to put that in the chutney. Um, okay, and so typically, one. It's very nice. So typically, you would cook this meat without sort of spices. And then can you I would... Guys... There's a very fat one over there. You have to see it. Oh, she's talking about the fake cook. Okay. So, I'm just going to... No. All right, the meat. All right, that's a rump. So, obviously the rump is nice because the rump... Well, the rump is great because... You know, the difference is, of course, it's got fat. And I mean, this isn't fat by standards of Namibia. And people will call me, this is really lean meat. But of course for here, this is a lovely piece of steak. This is, I'd reckon it's about sort of 600 grams, five, 600 grams easily. Um, and I just like the, you know, the variety. So it's just a combination of obviously bits, different bits of meat. As I said, people use things like intestines, liver, probably, probably possibly even kidney, a little bit of fat, and then it's just sort of cut on top of the um, the grill so literally you cut it here and serve it straight away thank you for watching Em's kitchen and uh, you can see Em's garden as well here's young Nina saying goodbye bye bye I'm bye gonna... bye 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 <laughs> right. I'm gonna enjoy the rest of the garden um, and just standing outside a little bit any questions drop me a line as always and I look forward to seeing you soon take care bye bye